This is a new system which is trying out of uh, wireless amplification. So it is good to know that uh, human technology, human uh, uh, interest in and development of means of improving creature comforts in this physical world given us the benefit of being able to talk in amplification without wires. We actually need to learn a little more of this technology so that we can have a hotline running right from where we are to the highest spiritual levels to which a human being can reach. What is the difference between an enlightened person and one who is not? When we talk of a spiritually enlightened person, he has a hotline, a wireless line, through which he can tap into the higher regions of consciousness and the higher levels of experience. While in this physical body, he can have access to things which are really beyond the physical. This great opportunity we have of being able to establish contact with the non-physical while still in the physical body gives rise to the great quest for spirituality and spiritual truth. We are going to spend these two days trying to understand how in the human body so much potential exists that we can make contact with higher levels of consciousness, with higher and more real experiences. When we talk of more real experiences, obviously I am using this phrase more real in the sense of a relative reality. Otherwise, there couldn't be something more real and less real. When I say more real, it only means more real than this physical world. Otherwise, it is very difficult to say what is real. The best definition I have ever heard of what is real is that which does not change. If something changes, it could not be real. It has a limited life. Therefore, if something does not change, it must be real. Absolute real would be that which absolutely does not change. Now, if we try to look around and introspect and try to determine is there something that we know which is really real or absolutely real, we find it is very difficult to look at anything that is real. The physical body that we are wearing itself goes away, so it could not be real. The world around us is changing constantly. All the seasons make all these trees and beautiful life patterns around us change. Every living thing has a beginning, a middle and an end. Therefore, they all change. Even the planets change. Even the whole cosmos changes. Dissolutions are taking place and new creation is taking place. The black holes are holding reservoirs of old galaxies that came into being and disappeared. And they are holding the future galaxies that are still to emerge. And what is there which is not changing? If the whole cosmos, if everything around us is changing, it could not be real. Therefore, the whole of creation outside is unreal. There is nothing we can see in this creation which we can call real. Our own physical body is unreal. Our own life here is unreal. Our feelings change all the time, therefore they are unreal. Our sense perceptions change all the time, therefore they are unreal. Our thoughts change all the time, therefore they are unreal. Our mind changes all the time, so it's unreal. Then what is real? The only real thing which we can notice in this entire drama of life and creation is that there is a conscious observer of this change. Somebody is watching through our eyes, through our sense perceptions, through a changing body, somebody is watching all the time. Who is that that watches the entire change that takes place around? That is consciousness. Consciousness which picks up experience of change never changes. Consciousness per se, without any attachment, without any external aids, like the body, like the mind, like the senses, like the world, like relationships, they all change, but consciousness which picks up the experience of change never changes. Therefore, the only thing we are aware of which never changes is our consciousness. 
And yet when we say our consciousness, it becomes changeable. Therefore, we cannot even say our consciousness. When we say our consciousness and we change, then our consciousness must change. Consciousness per se. Somebody observing who keeps on observing through every consciousness, who keeps on observing through every self, there must be a real self that watches the show around it and never changes. Consider this deeply. Spend time over it. Because the more you consider this proposition, the more you will realize the beauty and depth of the statement that the real self never changes. Everything else changes. Therefore, if there is something really real, it is the real self. The real self being that which is not the unreal self. Why do I make this distinction between a real self and an unreal self? Because we have associated our body with the self. Somebody gives us a name and we are called by that name. So we think this body is our self. But the body dies. The self does not. The self has watched this show, watched this drama since creation began, maybe perhaps even before creation began. If that conscious self, which is constantly there, is at the moment working through the body, the body does not become the self. The self is merely using the body. There is a simple English phrase which says, what is mine cannot be me. If I say, this is my jacket, obviously the jacket could not be me. If the jacket was me, I would not assert it is my jacket. The fact I can speak a sentence like this, this is my jacket means I am separate from the jacket. And I own or possess or use this jacket. That is why I say, this is my jacket. Distinguishing between me and mine. What is me is the one who claims this is my jacket. Therefore, the jacket becomes different from me. Similarly, when I say this is my body, I could not be the body. If I were the body, I would never say this is my body. The one who claims, the conscious being inside who claims this is my body, that alone must be the me, real me. And the body is being used like we are using a jacket. The body is no more than a jacket. If therefore we say, these are my senses, these are my eyes, these are my ears, this is my nose. If we claim different parts of the body which lead to sense perception, that these are mine, then we could not be any one of these sense perceptions. We only use them. Just like the body is being used by us, the sense perceptions are being used by us. They could not be us. We could not say the eyes are me, because they are my eyes. Therefore, I am separate from the eyes, but I use them. They are my eyes. I am using them. While they are with me, I will call them my eyes. If I am separated from them, I will say they were my eyes. I am still there, but not the eyes. Then, if the sense perceptions are not us, what else is? Are thoughts us? What about the mind? The mind as a thinking machine. The mind that picks up sense perceptions, interprets them, gives us meaning to life, and the mind that thinks all the time, the mind that reasons all the time. Is that me? No. If I say these are my thoughts, the thoughts could not be me. If I say my mind is worried, I could not be the mind. There is something else I am using called the mind, which is worried. If I am neither the body, nor the sense perception, nor the mind, who am I? Is there such a thing as a soul, something spiritual, something that goes beyond the mental realm of time, space and causation, something that is not bound by these dimensions of the mind? Is there something that may be real? But if we say, that is my soul, then even the soul is not me. If I say, my soul came inside my body, then I am neither the body nor the soul. Then who is me? Who is the self? The self is the one who claims my soul. Who has a soul? What is the self? Who could be the self that has an individual soul, an individual mind, an individual package of sense perceptions and a physical body to cover all this package in and then use it like a human being, give a name to itself and then mix up all this, mess it up and say this is me. 
knowing all the time, we just picked up this package of soul, mind, sense perception and the physical body, put them together. Instead of saying we are a very nice, good, good machinery to work for us, we have excellent gadgets to work for us, a gadget consisting of a soul, consisting of a mind, consisting of sense perception, consisting of the physical body. Instead of saying that, we began to say, this is me. Including all these things as part of the self. That this body is me, the senses are me, the mind is me, the soul is me. This error of misidentification, the error of misidentifying ourselves with the body, with the senses, with the thoughts, and with the soul, has created all the problems that we know of in the physical world. If this misidentification were not there, we would have no problem. Because there is no problem except what is created by our association with experience through these gadgets. These gadgets, this equipment that we carry with us, these establish relationship with outside experience. Outside experience consists of the inanimate and the animate. Out of the animate, the most Profound experience is that of other human beings who look and behave like us. When we have these relationships, our problems start. Supposing this world was full of beautiful trees, plants, flowers, birds, animals, but only one human being. There would have been no such word as a problem. The word problem could not have been written down. It is only when more than one human being came into this drama of life that we began to say there is such a thing as a problem. Therefore, we have created these problems by establishing what we thought were real relationships with the body. This physical body has created those relationships. Somebody asks me, Ishwar, has your daughter come with you? And I say, yes, my daughter is here with me. I fail to see the fallacy of what I am saying. It is not correct for me as a conscious being to say, my daughter is here with me. The correct statement, technically speaking, would be, my body's daughter is here with me. Because I was here before this body was there. And that was not the daughter of that me who was there before I was born. Nor will she be the daughter of the me that will persist even when this body dies. Therefore, just because we have established relationships through this body, we begin to take it that we are only this body. And when we confine ourselves to only this body, all the problems arise. All the troubles and problems that we are having and facing in a beautiful experience which is otherwise available to us are arising because we associate ourselves only with the body. We say, this is me. And then, if somebody says, this body is so temporary, don't you see people dying? Haven't we seen somebody lived and is no longer living? Where have they gone? Don't we see new babies being born? Where were they? Don't we see new babies born? They are so wild even in such young age that they behave as if they know more than their age would justify. Where are they getting it from? Don't you see babies who are so precocious, so intelligent, and babies who are so dumb, babies who are born with bright insight, and babies who are born blind? Don't you see all this happening? Where do they come from? Where are those little physical beings, those physical bodies, bringing up all this information and background from? There must be this consciousness that precedes physical birth and there must be consciousness that goes beyond physical birth. That is the self, not the body. If we realize this, that this physical body is not us, it would solve a lot of our problems. How do we find out that this physical body is not the self? Is there any easy way of finding out? One easy way, very easy way is to die. If you die, you know you are still living. You know this physical body is dead and you are still living. Then you have no doubt about it. You say, no, I want in the body because I am still alive. I can still see. I can still hear. I can still touch, taste and smell. I have all these sensory abilities still available to me and the body is lying dead and here are these people taking it to the graveyard, to the cemetery. They think I am dead. I am still watching this happen. We have some reported cases 
of what they call near death experiences. You must have heard. How many of you have heard of any near death experience? Please raise your hand. You have heard of somebody who had a near death experience. Thank you. I had a very interesting experience with a girl who was studying with me in school. In Lahore, Pakistan, in a model town where I used to live and went to school, elementary school, there was a girl. She was a good friend of mine, belonged to a Muslim family, and she used to share all her experiences with me. One day, she fell sick, got very ill, and they lost all hope of her surviving. I visited her home, which was just one block away from my home, and I was told she's already dead. That was very sad. And I went and sat there, and the parents were there. They said, she's dead, we have to now arrange for her funeral. And then the funeral was arranged. A coffin was prepared. The coffin was taken to the cemetery. When they were about to lower the coffin, according to the Islamic prayers and Islamic tradition, the coffin began to move. They opened up and the girl walked out. She was perfectly all right. She had no sickness. She went to school next day. And she and I walked together to school. And she told me what happened. And this is a first-hand account I got from the girl who was supposedly dead, had been put into a coffin, was going to be lowered. And she came out of that coffin. Next, next day while going to school, she told me what happened. She said she was lying down on the bed. She felt very weak. She felt she had no strength. She could not speak any words. And she tried to move, but she could not move. And then she saw her parents sitting next to her. And she tried to thank them for trying to take care of her, but she couldn't speak. She tried to force words out of her throat. She said, but I just couldn't speak. My throat was choked. And then she saw two Two men, strangely clad, two men coming in. Middle height. They came in and there was a door. We have in India doors that open out like this, you know, two ledges. So when you close, the two ledges close up. When you open, they both open outside. So there was a door of that room which was open like this. So the ledge of the door, there were two doors. These two guys who walked in and she saw them walk in. They jumped and sat on top of it. It looked very strange that two visitors should come and instead of sitting there on a chair, they should jump and sit on top of the door. One sat on one side, the other sat on the other side. And she watched and she tried to tell her parents, but she couldn't speak. She tried to raise her finger to point out towards those boys, but her hand was so weak, she couldn't point out. And the parents were very sad and she was asking them, what, trying to ask what was going wrong. And she couldn't speak. She couldn't move her hand. After a while, she found the parents were crying. She didn't know why. And those two guys who were sitting on top, they came down. And one stood in front of her towards the feet. And the other got, and she could see he was behind her head. And they picked up. Picked her up. She felt she was being picked up by them. And she said, don't my parents see? These two strangers have come and they are picking me up and they can't see. But they picked up so quickly. And she felt she was going to hit the ceiling. And she tried to scream that she was going to hit the ceiling. But she had crossed the ceiling before she could scream. And she was up in the sky. And in the brightness of the sky, she said it was so bright. But those two were carrying her as if they were flying with her. It was a strange experience. She said they must have noticed this strange miracle happening. That these two guys came and picked me up from my bed and took me out in the sky. After a while, she heard them talking to each other and they talked in her language, which was Urdu, in Urdu language, very chaste, pure Urdu they spoke. And they talked of the various businesses that they were attending to. And in the middle, she got the feeling they were talking about her. And after quite a while, she didn't know how long the flight lasted. She felt there were stars and there was sky and there was brightness, but she, she didn't know any sense, she did not have any proper sense of time. It looked like time stood still. Or probably time was going on. She couldn't say how much time she was there. At a certain point, she heard one of them say, we made a mistake. When she heard that we made a mistake, they began to descend. It was a very rapid descent. And as they descended, 
and she felt that this was very rapid. She got the feeling, you know, of a Ferris wheel, that big giant wheel going suddenly down, and she felt that. She had the sensation. She came, and then she thought she might hit. And then suddenly she felt somebody hit her on top of the head with a wood, wooden thing. And she tried to get it off, and they took her out of the coffin. So while the parents and others were having the experience outside of the body, she had this flight and came back and told me the story personally. I said, this is amazing. How can this happen? What was happening? Try to understand who was she? Because the body was here. Who was having the experience? Whether real or unreal is not important. Next week at the same time, she died. Again. They waited for a long time for her to wake up. She never woke up. She was dead. She never came back to tell you anything more. But this one event in my childhood convinced me that there is such a thing as a living experience almost like having the same body, very light which can fly, but which is not this physical body. Therefore, we cannot say the physical body is real. But dying and coming back is such a rare occurrence. I don't see many people doing that. So now new books are being published about people who give experiences of almost dead and then they come back. So this would not be the simplest method. Let us find a second simple method of finding out. If we are not the physical body, who are we? What are we as consciousness? The second simple method. The second simple method is possible because of a very strange device that the creator has bestowed upon us that is called human attention. Have you heard of this word, human attention? When you say, give attention to something, pay attention to me, somebody says, what does he want you to do? He wants you to neglect other things and put your attention there. He wants that your thoughts should subside from elsewhere and attend to that to which you are being drawn. This ability of human beings to give attention to one thing enables them to become inattentive to other things, which means by concentrating attention on one thing, you can simultaneously have withdrawal of attention from other things. It is this faculty that enables us to have the experience of being ourselves without the physical body. We could know who we are other than the physical body by using this method. Now, how is that done? If consciousness, if our thoughts and the inner self, which is not physical, if that is supposed to be real and the physical body is not, how about giving attention to that non-physical self, the conscious self within ourselves, to such an extent that we become unaware of the physical body? It is not impossible, it is not difficult. It will be as difficult as our attachments to this world that don't allow us to give attention to ourselves. When we close our eyes and want to withdraw our attention to ourselves, what comes in the way of that withdrawal is not the inability of human beings to concentrate their attention, it is the many attachments we have created, the many desires we have that take us outside of ourselves. The thoughts come into our head when we close our eyes and try to contemplate who are we? using this body. What is this living force? What is this living consciousness inside? When we try to sit within the eyes, within the head and try to contemplate what does not allow us to stay there are the thoughts that take us out depending upon the attachments we have created and the desires we have. The desires and attachments constantly make us run out of ourselves. Therefore, we cannot concentrate attention. But with practice, one can do it. With practice, one can do anything. Did you hear the story of that lady who used to carry an elephant? How many of you have heard that story? Only one. Okay, then I can, I can afford to repeat that story. Once upon a time, there was a king. I will be able to share a lot of stories of kings because in India we, are, we have a lot of stories of kings and we learn many spiritual lessons and uh, higher lessons of knowledge through the stories of kings. Once upon a time there was a king who was a very good marked man with bow and arrow. He could use his bow so accurately 
that he could, supposing he wanted to pick up this rose flower over here, he could send an arrow at a trajectory that would just clip the rose flower and fall and not touch the rest of the table or other thing. He was so accurate. He was very proud of his marksmanship. And one day, he was coming back after a hunt from the forest on horseback. When he approached his palace, he saw his wife, the queen, standing on the balcony of the palace. And in India, there is a custom for these ladies to wear some jewelry on the head or on the forehead. It hangs from there. She was wearing one of those pretty glittering jewelry with, with precious stones and gold on the forehead. And he saw that glittering jewelry on her forehead. And he said, let me give her the greatest surprise of her life today. And he so accurately sent his bow arrow. So accurately sent his arrow that the arrow went right to the balcony, came down, just took that ornament off and fell down and the queen didn't even know it. It was so perfect. When that happened, he went inside the palace, got off from the horse, walked up to the apartment and he said, my dear, I believe you used to wear an ornament. Where is it? She put her hand like this. She said, well, I always wear it, but maybe I missed out. Maybe I Put it somewhere else. He said proudly, No, you didn't miss it. Look, watch, there is lying, along with my arrow. I have today shown to you the marksmanship I have that my arrow could take off this ornament and so smoothly, you didn't even know it was off. And she said, That's not a big deal. What's that? By practice, you can do anything. He got so mad. He said, I am showing the best marksmanship. What a champion I am. And she said, that's no big deal. <laughs> he got so mad. He said, turn this woman away. We don't want her here. He got into such a rage. Which kings had this weakness, proneness to rage also sometimes. They got into great rage. And he got into such a big rage. He said, take this woman into the forest. Leave her into the forest. Let the wild animals eat her up. I don't want her. So his orders were carried out and she was taken into the forest and left there to die. In due course, the animals came and saw that poor helpless damsel in distress sitting in the forest. Instead of attacking her, they had pity for her, empathy for her and she became part of the forest life. The elephants would come, the lions would go and nobody would bother her. One day, the she-elephant, the female elephant, gave birth to a baby elephant. A small baby elephant. Such a pretty little baby elephant. When this woman saw, she was very happy. She picked up that baby elephant and gave a bath to that elephant in a nearby pond and jumped like this with joy and went all around making a big circle and came and put the baby elephant at the feet of the mother elephant. The mother elephant was amazed and surprised and very pleased. So she licked the baby elephant, picked her up and looked so lovingly, caringly to this woman. Every day this woman began to pick up that little baby elephant, give a bath, take it around and put it in front of the mother elephant. Little realizing that the baby elephant was growing rapidly. But since she was doing it every day, her muscles grew along with the weight of the elephant. And gradually the elephant became quite big and she still picked it up and went around like this doing like this and putting it there. Some hunters who were walking in that forest one day saw a woman carrying an elephant. They were shocked. She must be a magic woman. So they came to her. They implored her, come with us. We will give you a job in the city. We will take you to the town and make a show. So she went with them and began to give demonstrations of how she could pick up the big elephant, which was natural for her. And people paid tickets to see that show. Ultimately, the king came to know that there is a magical woman who can pick up an elephant. He said, I also want to go and see the show. So he went and he saw a woman who picked up an elephant. And he was so impressed. He came to her, walked up to her. He said, lady, you are the greatest woman I have ever come across. I have never seen anybody who can pick up a real live elephant like you do. You have done a big job. There is something great. He said, King, what is so great about it? It's not a big deal. The practice, you can do anything. When she said those words, then the king remembered, this must be my wife. 
Nobody else speaks like that. And he brought her back to the palace and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> the moral of the story is that in fact, there is nothing impossible. And by practice, you can do the most impossible things, most difficult things. Why do we have to say this? Because people tend to give up easily, especially when they want to deal with concentration of attention within themselves. And these attract detractions of attachments and desire, they pull us out and we say, oh, it's not possible. Maybe next lifetime. They want to give up so easily. That moral of the story should be remembered that practice can make us perfect in all situations. Now, if we were to practice this withdrawal of attention within ourselves, behind the eyes, where we feel our thoughts belong, where we feel consciousness is emanating from, if we close our eyes and withdrew attention to ourselves and contemplated upon ourselves and contemplated who are we, who am I, what is this self, what is this consciousness that is giving me thoughts, giving me sensations of my own body, and through the body, giving me sensations of the whole world? Who is that? Who is me? And look inwards towards your own self. And concentrate upon it. Concentrate to the extent that you forget everything else except this contemplation. Who am I? If you do that, what will happen? After a while, you will find you don't know where your hands are. Because if you attend to something so attentively, you forget where you place your hands, where your feet are. Gradually, you will become unaware of your hands and feet. You will become unaware of your arms and legs. And if you keep that concentration of attention on yourself on, you will become unaware of your body and thoughts. So, ultimately, you will only know you are a consciousness. And where is the body? You won't know. When you find that you have become unaware of the physical body, you look for it, then lying there. Is it lying there? I was in the body. How can body be lying there? You can see your own body. And then you find you can move, you can go anywhere you like. You still have the power to see, to hear, to touch, to taste, to smell, and the body is lying there. That is a personal verification that these sense perceptions are not arising because of the body. That they are independent. That they continue and persist even if the body were not here. Now, you haven't died. You have merely simulated the experience of death. Because if you have seen people dying, how many of you have seen people dying? Just raise your hand. Good. Those of you who have seen people dying would know. People who have died slowly, first of all, they don't know where their limbs are. That's the first thing that happens. They can't see where their feet and hands are. Then they can't know where their arms are. Where... Then the torso disappears. But they can still talk to us. They are still talking to us from the hospital bed and then they are no more. When they die behind the eyes, they are no more. Till then, the life force is still attached to the body. When we are concentrating our attention behind the eyes, within this body, what we are doing is simulating death. This has sometimes been referred to as dying while living. Dying while living is an experience which is a simulated experience of dying which does not lead to physical death of the body, still enables you to continue life as patterned already and gives you the experience what you would be experiencing after death. Therefore, if somebody wants to prove by personal experience what is our life like, who are we other than the physical body, you can do it by dying while living. When Paul says, I die daily, he refers to this. Because incidentally, all the mystics and the saints who did get enlightenment of the self other than the physical body did the same way. They talked of dying while living. They talked of having the experience of death while you are still not physically dead. This is a personal verification. You don't have to ask someone what it feels like. Anyone can do it. Every one of us is endowed with attention and consciousness. Every one of us is endowed with that life force. And everyone has the capacity to concentrate that attention behind the eyes and experience dying while living. Therefore, the way to finding out at least the first level of reality, other than the physical system, is to die while living. Reminds me of another story. 
How many of you have heard that story of the parrot? The merchant and the parrot. Okay, I can still repeat because there are many who haven't heard it. There was an Indian merchant. This is not a king story. The story of an Indian merchant who used to go to Africa for business. He used to take Indian silks and Indian garments and sell them in Africa and used to buy condiments and cashew nuts from Africa and bring them to India. He was an importer and exporter of commodities. During his business trips to Africa, he used to pass through a forest where there were very beautiful parrots, parakeets, beautiful birds, lovely feathers, all colored. And he used to like visiting that forest. Then one day he decided to bring one of these parrots back home. So he bought a cage and he caught one of the parrots in the forest, put in the cage and brought that parrot home to India. He fed that, uh, fed that parrot with different kinds of things that the parrot liked, like chilies, green chilies, Indian chilies, and all kinds of things. And he made churi, churi is made with flour, and the parrots liked them so much in India. So he gave all the goodies to the parrot to eat, and the parrot laughed and danced and enjoyed himself in that cage. So after a year, when this merchant was again visiting Africa, he turned to his parrot in the cage, and he said, I am going back to your home. Do you want to send any message? And the parrot said, Yes. Tell the folks back home, I am having a good time in this cage. I dance, laugh, enjoy, I make merry, and I eat good food. I am having a very good time here. So the merchant left. In due course, he reached the African jungle, and he met those parrots there. He called them together. He said, Hi folks, gather here. You remember, I took one of you, one parrot with me to India last year. He has sent a message to you. That parrot says, he is enjoying himself in his cage. He eats good food. He sings, dances and is making merry. When he said that, one parrot sitting on a branch of a tree right in front had tears in his eyes and he dropped down dead. And this merchant felt very sad. He said, this parrot must have been very close to the one I took to India, that he could not bear to hear this message. And he was feeling sorry. He went with his business trip and came back to India. Then he turned to his own parrot in the cage and said, I conveyed your message to the parrot in the jungle in Africa. And I told them, you are enjoying yourself in your cage, you eat good food, you are laughing, dancing, singing and making merry. But when I conveyed this message, one parrot, who must have been very dear to you, he had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. When he said this, the parrot in the cage had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. And the merchant said, Oh foolish man, if you knew that parrot could not, that parrot could not bear to hear this message, how could this one have heard it? Anyway, since the parrot was dead, he opened the cage and threw the dead bird out. As soon as he did that, that bird flew and sat on top of the wall. And the parrot and the merchant said, So you aren't dead after all? And the parrot said, No, I am not dead. Nor is that other parrot in the forest. He is not dead either. He only sent a message to me through you. And the message was, If you want to get out of this cage, you must die while living. This is, this is a story that these mystics and enlightened people tell us, if you want to find the reality of your own self within this body, experience the unawareness of the body, simulated death of the body, that you become unconscious of the body and then say, who are you? Look at yourself and you will find you are not only alive, you are more alive than you are now. This is by personal verification. Therefore, the truth of one's reality or reality beyond the physical self lies within oneself, not outside. You have to concentrate attention within the self and not outside. Therefore, when we talk of spirituality, we want to talk of higher levels of consciousness, higher awareness. Where is that higher awareness? Where is spirituality? It's all inside, not outside. No one has to go outside anywhere. If you stop going outside, you get the spirituality. Unfortunately, our tendency is to run outside for everything. Like the old woman in India 
who was searching for something under the village street light. He lived in a small village. And a young man came and he said, Ma'am, have you lost something? He said, Yes, I was sticking something. I lost my sewing needle. It was in my hand and I dropped it, so I can't find it. The young man said, Can I help you to find it? He said, Certainly. So the young man also began to look for the lost needle under that village light, the street light. After a while, he said, Ma'am, where exactly did you drop your needle? And she said, I dropped it in my house. And he said, then why are you looking for it in the street? He said, I have no light in my house. It's dark there. And we laugh over the story and that's precisely what we are doing. The thing that we want to find is inside us. But when we close our eyes, it is dark there. Therefore, we come outside and look for it in the libraries, in the research places, in the temples, in the churches, everywhere except within our soul. Why? Because there is darkness inside. There is no other good reason. When we say the truth is within ourselves, it must lie in the darkness when we close our eyes. How can it be outside? But no, it's dark, therefore we open our eyes again and go around attending workshops and attending lectures and doing anything else except going inside. Therefore, it is necessary. If one wants to know where is that workshop which can give us real knowledge, which can give us real truth. That workshop is not outside. That workshop we carry with our body all the time. That's the end in which consciousness operates. We carry the venue of the workshop with us all the time. We have to go within this, not anywhere outside. The real workshop takes place inside. This is the best mansion that was ever created. This human body is the greatest mansion ever created. It is so perfect. It is so compact. It contains, what does it contain, this mansion? It contains the entire creation, which projects itself through the sense perception. When we see things outside, why do we see things outside? We see them because we say we open our eyes. Let us see, is it really true? We see things because we open our eyes and we close, we can't see. But how do we see things? We see things because the light falls on things outside. And what the things absorb, we can't see. What they can't absorb, only that color we see. We have never understood this. That is, this young lady is wearing a blue dress. It is not the color of the dress at all. If it was blue, really, the dress, we would never see blue. We see every other color except blue. The so blue would be absorbed by the dress. That's the color. We are seeing that color which is not being absorbed. Blue is not being absorbed, therefore, with the external light, which is all the colors, that light we are seeing again reflected from her with the absorption of all colors except blue. How can we see what the color is, what she has? But yet we say, no, she's wearing a blue dress. Looks like that to us. Then what happens? The blue color dress comes in near straight lines, passes through the pupils of the eye, makes an image on the back of the retina, which consists of the extension of the optic nerve, of rods and cones which give us the form and color of what we are seeing. Because there is an inverted image of this dress inside on the retina, we say that is how we can see. How? Because the retina conveys the impulses through the rods and cones, through the optic nerve, to the right point in the brain where the power of seeing seems to rest. And when we are conscious, the consciousness picks up the message from that brain center and we can see that blue dress. Now, I want to consider along with you the possibility of the Lord giving us retina which creates their own pattern according to a predetermined program. And if the same thing were true of the other sense perception, I would experience this world exactly as I am experiencing now with no difference. If all the sense perceptions work the same way. Even if there was nothing on the retina, but the optic nerve had that power, even then I would see the blue dress the same way. Even if there was nothing in the optic nerve, only the brain center could generate these impulses, I would see the dress the same way. Even if there was nothing happening in the brain, only consciousness, which picks up the last message, had the power to create these images. It would create the same impulses in the brain, the same image on the retina, that I would see things exactly as they are. How do we know? Which is the causal direction? Is this world being created by us 
through consciousness or is consciousness merely receiving these impulses and experiencing what has already been created outside? How do we know? What is the nature of creation? Let us take the example of going to sleep at night. I believe all of you go to sleep at night. Those who don't can raise their hands. I believe all of you dream. Is there anybody who has never dreamt, never had a dream? So I suppose you all know what a dream is. When you go to sleep and have a dream, these eyes are closed. You see somebody wearing a blue dress coming to you. You are seen. You see other people walking around. You can even hold a workshop in the dream. And in the workshop you can raise this question. Are these people real or unreal? And you will ask each other, they will say, of course we are real, that's why we are attending the workshop. And these colors are real because you can see them. Everything will look real till you wake up. When you wake up, what happens? The whole thing disappears. Where did it come from? How could you see, touch, taste, smell, all that experience which was all within the mind? That world which you saw in the dream did not exist anywhere except in the mind. It looked like it existed outside. And while the dream lasted, it looked so real as this one. When we woke up in the morning, it disappeared as if it wasn't there. Could it be possible that this experience we are having now, this so-called living, real experience, is merely another state of dreaming? That we could wake up into a higher level of consciousness and find that all that we were seeing around was being created by our own mind. How can we find that out? It is possible, obviously. Because if that dream is possible, this one is possible also. How can we find out? The best way to find out would be to wake up. Just like the best way to find out if the other dream which we have at night, when we go to sleep, was it real or unreal? The best way is when we wake up, we know it was unreal. We don't have to ask any questions. Similarly, when we wake up from this dream, we can find out whether it's real or unreal. Therefore, when we are looking at this world, how real it is, whether it is contained in the head, in the mind, or it is really outside, can only be discovered when we wake up. When we die while living, we in fact have the experience of wakefulness and we find we created this world. So anybody can find out the causal direction, which means this body containing consciousness, containing the self inside, is creating this whole universe. Therefore, the whole universe, created universe, experienced universe, lies within this body. Not only the whole creation, the whole macrocosm is available here to us as a microcosmic form. We ourselves are also inside. Our creator also is inside. All the spiritual texts of the world say the creator is inside. Even the kingdom of the Lord is inside. Every text says so. They all direct our attention to insight. If this wonderful mansion contains the creator, ourselves, the entire creation, it must be a tremendous journey to go within. The greatest journey one could undertake would be going within. Now let's see, how long is that journey? How far do we have to go in order to go within? It would amaze people to know that we have to go nowhere. Because when we say within ourselves, that's where we are. The journey does not mean going anywhere. It means stop going anywhere. We are going all the time. Through our scattered attention. Scattering our attention through the sense perceptions outside. We are going out all the time. We have to stop this game of going out. When we stop going, we are there. We don't have to go anywhere to be inside our own self. We are there. We are the self. We don't have to go anywhere. We have to stop this way. So when we concentrate attention on just being where we are, being who we are, not someone else, just being who we are, being where we are, just being there, it is enough to set in motion the experience of dying while living and finding out the reality within ourselves. Supposing we did find out that we are a living force and we are not the physical body. Then what would happen? Then we would have a different experience. 
senses would continue to work exactly as they are working, perhaps better. Let us hear the experiences of those who can do it. Those who have done it, they find that there is tremendous light outside. Have you heard of this? Every person with a spiritual experience talks of light. Beautiful music, beautiful light. I have never heard anybody who has associated light and music with other things when going within, then real spiritual growth. Light and sound seems to be fundamental to any growth of spirituality, any growth into higher wakefulness. What would happen if we found we are not the body, we merely created and used the body, and who are we? We would be highly evolved living beings who have a longer life than this body, and this body is like a dream, the physical body is like a dream, the physical experience is like a dream, and that body has been living there some, some region, some experience of consciousness, which then opens up. Those who have had that experience, they describe that as you rise into that experience, you find this is a duplicated sky, there is a real sky with it, you can fly in that. They say you can cross the stars and the moon, and the sun, sun is of course considered like a star. The main regions to cross are the moon, the earth moon, other moon, primary moon. One moon can create all the moons. Like you have one moon and you put ten mirrors, they look like ten moons, they are reflections. One is enough to create the entire constellation, enough to create an entire galaxy. One of the piece is enough to create the whole universe. You pass through the region of the moon, the region of the star, the star. And you find that you are still going within your own self. When you can have that kind of a flight through attention within yourself, you come to a recreation or reliving or waking up into a state of light to which you always belong. And you wake up into that and you find you were always there. This was a short dream sequence which we call the physical world. And yet, the physical people who we meet now have a reality. Just like the dream people we meet at night also have a reality. I know Bob Ayako is a tough guy in the way he sits and he can really punch me if he likes. If he punches me now, if he hits me, I won't hit him back because he'll punch me again. What will I do? I'll keep quiet for now. But most likely when I sleep at night and have a dream, I'll see him in the dream, I'll punch him back. <laughs> What is the reason, what is the cause of that dream sequence that I punched him back in the dream? It was a wakeful sequence of his punching me. In the dream I won't know that. In the dream I will experience my punching him. But the cause of that lies in the wakeful state. When I wake up I can tell him, look Bob I punch you at night in the dream. And he laugh over it. This world and all the experiences that have been created here, are a reaction to what has happened in the past. Therefore, we call them destiny, fate. We say these are the reactions to past actions. Past actions in the higher wakeful state. Or they could also be in the previous dream state. Because one dream, when I tell him when I wake up, I punch you. Next time, I may carry that memory with me. And the second night when I sleep, he may punch me again in the dream. For having punched him in the previous dream. So you can have certain motion a series of actions and reactions, which in the Eastern philosophy we have called the law of karma. The law of karma is nothing more. That whatever action you do, there is a reaction to that. So, whatever seeds you sow, you have to bear the fruit of that seed. As you sow, so shall you reap. That is the law of karma. So, this law keeps on operating to create the patterns of life, to create the projections of experience that we get out of consciousness. This is happening because we keep on waking and going to sleep. That is why this keeps on happening. When we wake to a higher stage, we find the real nature of the people whom we have met here. We find their reality. We find that is a very different world. What are the differences? First of all, in that world, we find there is no gravity to pull us down and age us. We live so long indefinite because there is no gravity, weightlessness, we can fly at will, we can go where we like. The weight of being here is taken off, suddenly. 
Not the physical weight, all kinds of weight. The second kind of weight which bothers us here is the mental weight, which we call the weight of keeping a secret and feeling of guilt. This weight of secrecy and guilt which we carry here and not being able to be sure what the other person is thinking is lifted because telepathy is a normal phenomena, normal communication at that level. When we wake up, we find that we can think and the other person knows. The other person thinks you can know. You can't have any secrets anymore. And the whole pattern is known. Therefore, you can't have that feeling of guilt anymore. You can't hide anything. You can't have the immorality that we can have in this physical world. Just by one little change in the way of living in a higher level of consciousness, all these weights are taken off from us. Similarly, the weight of darkness is taken off. Because here we cannot see a single thing, nor a single person, unless external light falls upon the thing from the person. But in the higher level of wakefulness, everything carries its own light. It's self-illuminated. Light flows out of things. You can see everything brilliant, bright. It does not need any external light to see what it is like. It carries its own color and its own form and its own light. Every person, every thing, every living cell, every non-living cell. This very world which you see here, you will see the reality, how trees are glowing in reality. How the buildings, new designs, new architecture, new forms and patterns are existing, all self-illuminated. Therefore, the very big weight of darkness which affects us here is lifted. Similarly, we find the weight of ignorance is lifted. One of the big weights upon us here is ignorance. We don't know something. How do we know? It's very difficult. In the physical world, it's very difficult to know something. We read books, we ask people, we try to discipline ourselves, we pass examinations, go to universities. In order to know and learn something, we do so much. And in that life, which for short, because it is not physical life, I will call the astral life. In that astral life, which is higher than this life, we find knowledge can be picked up from the shelf, like a book can be picked up from the shelf in a library here. So whatever is in that book, whatever is in that volume of knowledge, becomes our knowledge instantly. We pick it up. There's a big shortcut. That weight of ignorance goes. It still leaves you open to have any knowledge that you like. But you have a choice of picking up any knowledge without the weight of ignorance. So, so many weights are lifted from us. That becomes a different way of living. And the reality of this world comes in sharp illumination before us. And we can say we are enlightened. What have we done to get all this? Nothing except put our concentrated attention on our own self and become unaware of the physical body and all this happens. But supposing we were to continue this process, in the astral body, we were to withdraw our attention within that body, we would find even the sense perceptions are not necessary for experience. Even the eyes and the ears are not necessary, whether physical or non-physical. They are also a burden upon us as we rise to a still higher level of experience and consciousness. By putting attention upon our own self, the same procedure, the same simple method. When we put our attention on ourselves, again, within the astral body, we become unaware of the sense perception. We lose the awareness of the senses and then we only have the thought to live with. The thought, the concepts, the ideas, and we find that's a complete life. Not only is it complete, we find all sense perceptions are created because of those thoughts and concepts which are the mental life. We refer to that as the causal level of consciousness. Why do we call it the causal level of consciousness? Because it is the cause of all the astral and physical levels of experience. If that were not there, we would not have any other experience below. What happens if we were to withdraw our attention further within the mind? and become unconscious of our thoughts. If we withdrew our attention, again within our own self, within the seat of consciousness, within the very self that is experiencing thought, if we withdraw attention and concentrate on consciousness and not on thought, making thought external to ourselves, and get to the core of thought, which is possible to do, then we find that we are not the thought either, that we don't need thought. And we become what has been called the spirit or the soul. 
And that soul has a living force, a living consciousness, and no one is real compared to all these, including the mind. Then what do we find? We find that the mind used to do thinking, not the soul. The mind used to do sensing, interpreting, not the soul. The mind used to do this craftsmanship, not the soul. The mind used to be responsible for creativity, not the soul. What is the soul doing in the meanwhile? When we rise to our spiritual heights to that level, of knowing our own soul, we find the soul is performing three functions like the other things, and they are the most beautiful functions that consciousness performs. And they are one, intuition, two, love, three, beauty. When you get the experience of intuition, a flash of knowledge without time, space, or causation, love, which is identification with another, forgetting the ego or the I, and beauty, the aesthetic experience of seeing something that makes you have a joy and happiness beyond measure, that these are experiences coming from, the, from your own soul. A soul experience, an experience of one's own self, own spiritual self, without these external garments of physical body, of senses and mind, is the first spiritual experience. It is supposed to be the start of the spiritual journey. Where does the journey end? When it starts from the soul, it ends when we find that even the soul is covered by a strange garment called individuation. The feeling of being just one amongst many itself is illusion. As much an illusion as the other things that we are talking of. When that illusion is broken and we find there is just one soul, there is just oneness, there never was more than one. When that discovery comes up at the fifth level of consciousness, we can then say, now we know what spirituality is all about. And all this can be accomplished. Up to the fifth level, it can be accomplished. While we are still in the physical body, and the astral body, and the causal mind, and the spiritual soul, having all these together, we can get into a oneness of consciousness, which alone is the unchanging, real, absolutely real self. So there is only one self in reality. That's unchanging. It has never become two. It has never had any interruption. It has never had any confinement, any restraint. And therefore that one self, which is a single consciousness, looks like the many when we become soul. Looks like individuated minds and thoughts when we become the mind, when we start wearing a mind. Looks like sense perception when we become the astral body looks like physical bodies then become the sent to the fifth dream of the physical world. Spirituality is going back to higher and higher levels of wakefulness. As we awake higher, we find more and more of ourselves. Therefore, the key to all this experiment is the real venue of workshop. The real venue of a workshop is this head and not a room outside. If you want to find out the truth of all the things that I have said, they cannot be found outside. You can hear words about them, language, descriptions, and so on. But descriptions and words do not take us to the journey. Supposing I get, I got all the time schedules, all the timetables of every airline and every ship and every train of the world and started reading them and I went through all the guidebooks of every country of the world, I would still be at home. Merely reading these texts, reading these guides, and reading these books will not take me anywhere unless you start the journey. Similarly, if we read everything in books about the spiritual journey within and go on reading and spend our whole life in reading, we will not have started our journey. The journey starts when after reading the book, we put it aside and start going within. In this case, with the drawing attention within. Therefore, in this workshop, it will be my endeavor to share with you some features of what it means to be within this lovely spot that is called our head and what is contained in the head so that we can actually go and visit some of these beautiful spots that exist in the head and experience the direction in its spirituality life. We'll spend the whole of tomorrow on investigating what is this head that we carry. Is it really a mansion, a room in which we can sit? How do we sit in this? Can consciousness 
take a seat in this head behind the eyes and what should it do in order to get the experience of seeing all these things? What is the nature of spiritual experience? How does it come within this head? We are going to investigate this during this workshop. I am open to questions so that we know exactly what we are about. I have given you a general description of the possibilities, the potential within this head. Yes. Lot of people have done it. When Socrates said, know thyself, which is on record, he was drawing our attention exactly to this. He says, know thyself. Don't think this is yourself. Either the physical body that is seeing things, or the senses, or the eyes, or the mind. Know yourself as the consciousness that can watch. That's your real self. That question was raised from that time. It has been raised all the time. We have philosophers, saints, mystics, scientists, even Albert Einstein. His main concern when he died was, who is this observer? Because he suddenly found that depending on the position of the observer in this universe, the whole universe changes. Then where is the real observer to see the real universe? Time is a creation. He found that out. Time can be twisted and distorted depending on the velocity of light and your velocity. You travel at the velocity of light yourself, you can't have a time. There is no time left. You travel little less than that, time is very slow. Travel slower than that, time is fast. When he found time to be so unreal, and time is unreal, space is unreal, what else was real? And what is real? He found the observer who is observing this fact is real. He said, maybe the velocity of light may be real. The next best thing to, to the observer, to conscious observer, he was sure conscious observer is real. Otherwise, you couldn't have anything. But next to the conscious observer, he gave light the next best reality. Because the velocity of light did not change and did not have the Doppler effect. Whether you go towards the light or go away from the light, the velocity remains the same. It does not follow any other law of a wave motion. Therefore, he said, light may be real. But then, as soon as he died, the other, his own students who were working on it and had developed better telescopes to see at the outer fringes, they saw the quasars and they saw moving bodies which were going at velocities higher than the velocity of light. So, light became no longer real. Okay. So, the only thing left real was the observer. The conscious observer remained the only reality in the eyes of the scientist today. And who is the observer? Just try to find it. They know he's conscious. If he's not conscious, he can observe nothing. But could not be the body and the physical universe and the physical senses because they are all subject to change by time. Therefore, that consciousness, that conscious observer in us who does not change must be real. Let's find that out. People have been trying all, all the time. This is an old question. And why is this question relevant for us? This question is relevant because an investigation to this question who we are. Even a halfway house investigation, not going all the way to the discovery of the original source, even a halfway house shows us the physical is not real. The sensory is not real. The thoughts are not real. That much is good enough to make us the happiest people that you will find in this creation. And people are looking for happiness. You look at people who turn to God, and I find most of the people who turn to God turn to God because of unhappiness. Something has happened in this life and they say, oh God. <laughs> and I find people who say we are having all good time, they forget God at that time. It looks like unhappiness is the only motivation for us to look for reality. And if we look to reality, and reality is within ourselves, we don't have to go anywhere, then at least it can take care of the single problem of unhappiness. 